After so recently helping strike down Roe v. Wade, Justice Alito is not satisfied. He wants to go on a bit of a victory tour and go around bragging about what he's done. And at the same time, insulting world leaders over it, which is a weird course to take. Take a look at this. I had the honor this term of writing, I think, the only Supreme Court decision in the history of that institution that has been lambasted by a whole string of foreign leaders <laughs> who felt perfectly fine commenting on American law. One of these was uh, former Prime Minister Boris Johnson, but he paid the price. <laughs> Post hoc ergo propter hoc, right? <laughs> but others are still yeah, are still in office. President Macron and uh, Prime Minister uh, Trudeau, I believe, are too. But what really wounded me, what really wounded me, was when the Duke of Sussex addressed the <laughs> United Nations and seemed to compare the decision, whose name may not be spoken, with. The Russian attack on Ukraine. Get you a crowd as eager to awkwardly laugh as that one was for Samuel Alito. I don't know what the joke was, but they seem to like it. In any event, in a few minutes, we're going to be diving into the actual substance of what the recent destruction of Roe v. Wade is doing, what effect it's having on people around the country. But but I want to pause on what he had to say there because it is an interesting thing to lay out that. The concept that it's weird that these world leaders would even opine about such a massive change in the status of rights that have existed for more than half a century. It's not, I don't generally think of the right as being very slow to criticize other countries' politics or talk about how we might be better than them in a variety of ways. And I personally found it at least somewhat heartening that so many people around the globe uh, they, they felt it deeply, the, the loss of these rights, that they cared about it. Even though America has all the different negative effects you know, in countries around the world that we have, um, you know, historically and up into the present, they still care about what happens here. We have viewers all the time who have, who have written in, said that they're worried about us. I know people who've traveled abroad have had people make those comments to them. So it's such a weird thing to say that it's weird that Macron or Trudeau or whoever would have an opinion on such a massive reversal of long established precedent. Jessica, I want to start with you. What do you think about this? Yeah, this is embarrassing. Samuel Alito doing this is just embarrassing. He is the person who wrote the majority opinion where he cited some research that the domestic supply of infants was down. Okay, many people have taken just that one citation and thought, what does this mean for our future? And many world leaders, we're watching what was going on in the United States since the leaked opinion and then when the Dobbs v. Jackson ruling came out. And the reason so many global leaders are concerned is because the United States is teetering towards human rights violations. To force your citizens to give birth, forced pregnancy is a war crime. It is a violation of human rights law and the United States is getting very close to committing human rights violations. And for him to say Boris Johnson, even Boris Johnson mm -hmm. sees how awful this is. That's what I would take away from that. And for him to say that Boris Johnson, you know, being removed from office essentially is because of this is ridiculous and he acknowledges his own logical fallacy, mm -hmm. right? He says, you know, post hoc ergo proctor hoc, which means or proctor hoc, which means, you know, after this, therefore, because of this, because this happened, that means this causes it. And he gets a laugh from the room. He knows what he's saying is wrong and he's doing it anyway. And that seems to be a pretty pretty common theme nowadays. Well, there's a market change here. Alito was appointed under Bush and most of the Republican appointed Supreme Court justices until recently have not been so explicitly interventionist in their public language. So what we see Something that's really happened is that the Supreme Court has become a politicized instrument of the right wing, right? And that's something that has been true in terms of some of their decisions in the past, but not in their sort of bold, outspoken types of comments. So the fact that Alito, whose you know draft report was leaked, and so that's something we have to explore here. How did that occur, right? Mm -hmm. To actually build support for that opinion, which Roberts himself was trying to mitigate. The fact that that's occurred meant means that we have arrived at a time where the Supreme Court is explicitly political. 
explicitly interventionist and is not precedence based, right? Most courts, at least in the history of the United States, tend to elevate the value of historical precedent in their interpretation around overturning various laws. And that's not the case. And that's why we all as people and those of us who are progressives need to organize also seeing the Supreme Court as a potential antagonist. Um, and then the other point I just wanna make very briefly is, remember who is paying the price for these decisions? It's women, it's largely women of color, it's working class women, and it's women in rural and poor states and red states. Yeah, as well as members of the trans community, exactly. Look, and uh, he, you talked about the sort of generational shift where now they're they're a little bit more explicit about it. And we know that even inside of him, when he was being nominated during his hearing, he didn't say, "Oh yeah, no, I'm totally gonna get rid of it. I, I think it, I think it's garbage, or I don't care, or my God told me, or whatever. I don't care. If you put me on the court, I'm gonna get rid of it." That was the truth. That's the truth now. That was the truth then. But he couldn't say it then. They all lied. They all they all knowingly lied. The hiding the fact that they are, they're partisan hacks. That's why they're on the court. That's why they were moved up through the system. People like Amy Coney Barrett. This was the strategy. It was a conscious strategy that the right pursued for literally decades. And at the tail end of that strategy, we're supposed to pretend that, oh, they're just, they're just neutral, divinely inspired judicial instruments. They're not people. They don't, they don't have flaws or opinions or you know a worldview that's shaped by where they were born and that sort of thing. They're just interpreting, it's all garbage. It's all BS. And way too many people, and not just people on the right, I think believe that, that that's what it is. Um, I, I do wanna ask you though, cuz you mentioned the leak. I, I wanna touch base with both of you and just see what you think. Because that was a big focus of the right. When the leak happened, was we we have to discover what this is. Don't pay any attention to what it'll mean if Roe v. Wade is actually overturned. Let's focus on the leak. It's the most important thing ever. And now, they don't seem to care. I don't hear any of them talking about it. And they gave up quite a while ago. Um, and I know that there's some theorizing that the leak might not have been uh, le done uh, as was initially theorized to. You know, to scare them into not overturning it. Clearly, that didn't work. We have that hindsight now, um, but actually, to potentially impact other conservatives and and lock them in. What do you what do you think about those theories about the leak and whether we'll ever find out who it was? What we see occur here, and John, both you and Jessica pointed this out, is Supreme Court justices acting like Republican right wing American politicians, and I think that's a market change, not just in terms of kind of temperament. But actually, thumbing their nose at the international community, right? Mm -hmm. So we saw that, of course, with the illegal Iraq War, right? That was an illegal war, a human rights violation, as Jessica pointed out. And we saw, you know, our political leaders thumbing their noses at the rest of the world around that. Now our justices are doing that. Now, in terms of the leak, this to me comes straight out of the Trump playbook, where there were tons of leaks all the time, right? And I'm not sure how many of them were directly connected to Trump or not. But basically, what happens when these things circulate, and we were all part of that is we all get polarized and we all get freaked out. Those of us on the left or who are progressives or even just conscious people are traumatized with anxiety and it's very difficult for us to know what to do. Mm -hmm. And those of us who are on the right um, really kind of, it's like revving it up, you know, hit the drums, drum beats of war. And so I feel like this is very typical of the way politics in the United States has shifted over the last decade, especially since 2016. Jessica? Yeah, my mind immediately replays the news that week, Fox News, what right wing pundits were saying, and they were all saying, what does this leak mean for the sanctity of the court, <laughs> right? Not concerned about overturning president, but concerned about the sanctity of the court. How could you possibly leak something like this? But I think I would agree that it was most likely someone on the right because this meant that not only were they going to foment a bunch of support from the people who have been involved in overturning Roe v. Wade for so many years, all of these anti-abortion activists, but also to keep the justices in their original opinion. Because if this leaks and someone changes their opinion from when Alito wrote to when Dobbs v. Jackson was actually ruled on, now they become a target. And I think they're actually afraid of the right wing as well. And so I think it's more likely that it was the right. Obviously, the right is responsible for destroying the sanctity of the Supreme Court and making it a politicized entity. Yeah. 
Exactly, yeah, and look, I, I want to know the truth of all things, so I would like to know. Um, but we do have to acknowledge uh, if we found, let's say that we found out that Alito did it himself. He filmed a vlog or whatever where he says, I'm gonna totally do this and it's gonna help. <laughs> People wouldn't get their rights back. It wouldn't affect anything. Like if you if you live in one of these states, you'd still be screwed. So um, I would like to know, maybe it would hurt them politically a little bit. But there's no there's no shaming the Supreme Court into changing course, especially once they've already decided on something. And I doubt even going forward, they're not worried about that at all. Um, but really fast, I do want to touch base again with the substance of what this change um, accomplished. If we go to this first graphic, you're going to see some of the breakdowns depending on where you live about where the status of your rights uh, as of today. Uh, but bear in mind, it is just today when we're filming this. I can't attest to which of your rights the Republicans might strip away in the next day or two. Uh, you never know, it's exciting waking up in America. Um, but as of right now already, some 40 million uh, women and I, I will add uh, and others as well of childbearing age live in states where abortion has become more difficult to access. Uh, about 600 and 630,000 abortions were performed in the US in 2019 alone. Um, the decision so far, of course, uh, to overturn it has not been popular. About two thirds disprove of it. Um, but the fact that what they want is wildly unpopular has never stopped the Republicans before. So they're staying the course. Now there are those aside from just us on the panel who've criticized Samuel Alito. AOC tweeted, remember it was Alito's opinion that, that leaked. That fact paired with his politicized remarks below should be alarming to anyone. The Supreme Court is in a legitimacy crisis. Chief Justice Roberts has a responsibility to share the progress and results of SCOTUS's leak investigation. And we, we talked about um, but you'll possible Supreme Court reform a little bit on TDR this morning. And I do want to open it up to both of you to talk about that as well, because I think AOC is totally right to uh, to focus on the legitimacy, legitimacy crisis. But the crisis has not very little to do, as we've already alluded to, with the leak. It doesn't even, to me, have that that much to do with uh, precedent being overturned. That's that's worrying. It's more that like the entire process has been, it's, it was never good. It wasn't good back in the 90s, but it makes no sense now that so much of our thought about the most important judicial body in the country focuses on should this person retire? Should they maybe try to wait six more months because people's rights might depend on who wins the next election? What if this person dies? What could that mean for all sorts of different, it makes no sense. The Supreme Court is so overdue for massive reform and not reform that necessarily has to benefit leftists or Democrats or whatever. But you can come up with a far better way to do this so that you don't have you know, an ever widening gap at the end of a term of a presidency where now they just won't allow you to confirm someone, um, let alone all of the other problems. So I'm curious what both of you think about the prospects for and how you would shape reform if it were up to you. Yeah, I think we have two options that people are talking about a lot right now. One is to stack the court, right? That's the obvious one where we just add additional justices. There's nothing in the Constitution that says it has to be nine justices. There have been more than nine in the past. That's one option, of course. Uh, and, and that's an option for a reason, right? They created our system of government with checks and balances, where if the judicial branch oversteps, the executive or the legislative branch can step in and correct that overstep. I think we're in a situation where this is a pretty clear overstep. The other option would be to impeach Supreme Court justices. They're impeachable so long as uh, they're exhibiting bad behavior, anything that's not considered good behavior. So breaking the law, lying under oath, I don't know, someone's wife was involved with an insurrection, all of these things. That's I bad. think that's really bad. Yep. Uh, all of these are good reasons to impeach a Supreme Court justice, I would say. But then also, like, just consider, should six people even be able to determine the rights for everyone in a democratic system? Should we even have a system where that is something that can happen? Is the Supreme Court something that is necessary? I think that's up for debate right now as well. In, in my mind, much of the recent sort of, you know, over the, a lot of this dates back, you know, there's a longer history to this, of course. We have multiple members who are now confirmed on the Supreme Court who have, who have either committed sexual assault and or have lied under oath, right? We see, we see, Pretty solid evidence when it comes to multiple members of the current Supreme Court, and you got to fight fire with fire because a lot of this fire started, you know, in its most recent phase with what happened when Merrick Garland was nominated by Obama 
and McConnell, you know, straight up gangstered that out of out of possibility. And so that's why, you know, remember, two presidents who were not elected with the popular vote have dominated the number of justices that are on the Supreme Court. So we have to think every every tool in the toolkit needs to be put out. Term limits, impeachment possibilities, packing the court with more justices, every ball. But but really this kind of gets to what every single time I'm on the Young Turks I always think about and I feel it in my own life, which is they are they being the extreme right have taken over the Republican Party and are extremely aggressive. <laughs> And the question is, is what is it going to take to counter that? You have to counter that type of fire with fire. And that's not true in every case when it comes to legislative possibilities. For example, I know a different story, this mansion Schumer agreement. You know, I mean, it wasn't what I wanted, but it's way better than nothing. Let's mm-hmm. hope it happens, right? I'm not saying for everything we need to be, you know, in everyone's face and, you know, punching people in the face. But I think when it comes to dealing with the extreme right on this issue, I think we got to be really, really aggressive. And the question is, what is this? What is it going to take to convince Biden and the centrist Democrats to really recognize this is an existential threat for people and human rights in this country that this Supreme Court represents? Yeah, and it's so weird that that they they will be the last ones to ever acknowledge it. The the ones who right. who theoretically have the most ethical obligation to be on guard for this sort of thing, who ostensibly due to their career should be the ones who are focusing most on it. Regular people get this, regular people who are busy just trying to survive, working their jobs. They understand all of this, but Nancy Pelosi wants a strong Republican Party and Joe Biden is friends with Lindsey Graham or whatever. They're gonna be the last to understand it. In terms of their their position on this, how radical they are in these particular areas, we are in such a weird position right now because they they hold beliefs in this area, you know, getting rid of Roe v. Wade, but the, but on a lot of other areas as well related to it that are obviously out of step with the American people. They know that they don't care. They've tried for half a century to sway people to their way of thinking, and they failed. And when that didn't work, they just decided to get the Supreme, people on the Supreme Court instead. Um, and they, we know how excited they are that they succeeded with Roe v. Wade. We know that the they're going to want more. The actual the the thirty percent of the the country that this is all that they think about when it comes to politics. They want more. They want to take out IVF. They want same sex marriage to be made illegal. They're not interested in throwing it to the states. That's a stopgap measure and nothing more. They want it to be illegal on every inch of American soil. But at the same time. The elected Republicans know how wildly unpopular those positions are. They're worried about getting wiped out, maybe not so much in these midterms, although that's swinging back towards the Democrats a bit, but certainly in 2024. And so they and the pundits all have to pretend that any talk of next steps is crazy talk. You're going to crazy town, you're playing games. We would never wanna do anything like that. But they're saying that knowing that their base desperately wants to go farther, that what, 10, 15% of the country wants to outlaw interracial marriage, let alone same sex marriage. And so it's so weird to, to try to counter this movement when they know that they have to lie about all of their positions, and yet they do still have to appeal to those people to win primaries, to get them to support them. Any final thoughts about that? Being less bad than fascists isn't an inspiring political strategy. That's not gonna bolster people to support the party, to support movements for change. That's not fighting fire with fire, fighting fascism with please give me $15 and continue to vote for Democrats. Just really <laughs> isn't it, I'm sorry, especially especially when you endorsed an anti-abortion candidate, Henry Cuellar in Texas, yep. come on. We need a party that's going to propose actual change, that's going to actual talk, actually talk about constitutional amendments, actually talk about the reforms necessary to keep our democracy intact. We don't have that in the United States right now. We just don't have a strong opposition party to the rise of fascism. I think that you made a really important point there, John, or at least you were alluding to it um, from how I interpreted it, which is really that the Republicans who are elected to Congress or are part of Congress can actually hide behind the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court in a sense is some sort of like shadow army or a front Hey, it's mm-hmm. just it's just the court. It's just interpretation. It's it's just law. It's precedent. It's you know how it and and so in a sense that actually is very very effective for the Republican Party in when it, when candidates or elected representatives can make decisions how explicit they want to be on issues that are wildly unpopular with the American public 
and just defer to the Supreme Court. So that actually allows their, them to have their cake and eat it too. Mm-hmm. And you're totally right, Jessica. I mean, we have, we the people <laughs> have to fight back here. And you know, having been in Mexico, which is a Catholic country and a conservative country, though very left in a lot of other ways as well. People were just repeatedly, every single day I was there for the last month. Every single day people were saying, what's going on with your country? Because people around the world, for better or worse, do look to our country to see what's going on. And it has a massive spillover effect I've seen with people I've met from all around the world ever since this draft decision was leaked and the decision was made. Thanks for watching The Young Turks, really appreciate it. Another way to show support is through YouTube memberships. You'll get to interact with us more. There's live chat emojis, badges. You've got emojis of me, Anna, John, JR. So those are super fun. But you also get playback of our exclusive member only shows and specials right after they air. So all that, all you gotta do is click that join button right underneath the video. Thank you.